show the picture again? No, you don't have to. Hey there, hi there, ho there. It's me, Bear, the Gen X GM. Hope you're doing all right. We are live. We're having such a great conversation in the backstage. We decided to go 59 seconds early for you all. And also, Bunny's not here making us late, so it works out even perfectly that way. Of course, I am joined by Cody, Brian hey. from Game Masters, Sean, and Logan from The Hilt. But our guest of honor tonight is Mr. Tim Cask, who we insist we must call him Tim. So, Tim, welcome to the show, sir. Welcome to the floor. Well, thank you. Now, Tim. I am going to open the floor to these gentlemen because they are much bigger D&D guys than I am, and they're going to have actual valid questions where I'm just going to be like, what was it like living in uh, Lake Geneva? So well, I, 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 You have no idea how many times I've answered those kind of questions over the years. <laughs> Various documentaries and just, you know, nosy people. and Yeah, I've had that question a number of times. I Actually, I didn't live in Lake Geneva. We lived in Delavan, which was 11 miles west much more of a chill town in the summer um in the in the summertime when the tour the as we call them the flatlanders were flocking to the lake um i went a whole different route up north around the end of the county and down and i came into lake geneva from the backside so to speak uh just to avoid all the uh the mobs of, tour, of tourists downtown no that's fair all right, does anybody have a question they'd like to open up with tonight for uh, Tim? Yeah. Like, oh, we'll pull something. oh, Cody, beautiful. Go ahead, Cody. Uh, so, Tim, lovely to yeah. talk to you. We talked a few years ago. First off, where do I get the uh, awesome curmudgeon in the cellar hat? <laughs> um, the, there were four made. A buddy had a guy, a friend who did these. He made four. He kept one. I have one. There was one that was a real feminine blue that I gave to somebody who was, and it was in Dollywood the next week, oh, getting a picture in it. And um, I don't remember what happened to the fourth. I mean, he, he priced them and it was stupid money. I, you know, who's going to pay 30 or $35? for a ball cap even though it's a decent cap and yeah you know it's got a solid strap in the back and it's none of that you know chicken wire crap on the top it's it's a nice cap but uh unless you know i i can't make an order of 300 or 500 to get the right, right, right. down because well, my my great 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 grandchildren will be wearing curmudgeon hats <laughs> oh you can do a uh, um uh, a build on demand place like uh was it red spot or i have never even looked into it if it if there had if there be if there comes a demand i might look into it but uh, put a community I, tab on your channel who wants a curmudgeon hat <laughs> oh, 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 oh. no 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 come on man. i'm <laughs> 75 retired and living the life. I just got back from Gary Con. It's been a hell of a fucking two weeks. Oh, you cuss on this? Oh, go right the fuck ahead. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Tuesday before I got gut punched with this hideous flu Ugh. that lasted about 60 hours and made me muzzy headed for two days after. So we've been killing ourselves, we being Don Samora and I, trying to get out the lost adventures for Gary Khan. Well, he ran his candle so low, he ended up with a, uh, an, an infection in his pericardium. Oh, my. That's the lining you know, around your heart. Mm -hmm. And so he ran himself into the hospital. So needless to say, we didn't make it. Then Jim died. Jeez, that was man. another gut punch of enormous magnitude hit me much harder than I might have predicted if somebody had ever asked me in advance, uh, you know, anyway. So, uh, so it's, it's been, um, it's been a brutal, brutal two weeks. I can imagine. Well, thank Gary you for Khan was great, but I further ran down the batteries. So this is the longest, I don't have con crud. It's my normal things are starting to pollen. So I'm getting my hay fever. Uh, uh I don't have con crud, but I have the rundown you get after, except it's lasted about three days now. Okay. But I took my great grandchildren with my wife out, three of them, to go pee pee golfing, and then we took them for pizza. No, so, nice. you know, it's it's coming back, and just the batteries got a little low. 
Well, we appreciate you making the time for us tonight. Oh, That's well, this is sitting on my butt talking. This is something I can do on my deathbed. <laughs> Are you kidding? You said you're living the dream. That is my dream to do exactly what you're doing for a living. Yeah, well, okay. yeah. Um, I just had a game come out with old guard, old game, old guard games, which is part of the world of game design. I just had uh, Curse of the Weaver Queen come out um, about a week and a half, two weeks before Gary Con, the Kickstarter finally fulfilled. It's gorgeous. They took my the first half's me and the second half's stuff i had done to say okay dms if you want to take this further well they took it further okay so they made it a two-parter and it's a very nice product and i'm very pleased with the packaging and everything however it's a new kind of game box that i've never seen before and you can uh, you absolutely cannot put anything on top of this oh really yeah it's a new style design box but um and i'm not knocking it you know, don't give me, don't, don't, you know, I don't know. I'm just real skeptical because, uh, you know, sometimes when things are described for sale, uh, you know, they'll say, you know, dished or whatever, uh, this will be creped. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, just before I came on, I saw something on, somebody sent me a link that some dude's trying to sell Dragon One, which is rated 9.6. For her thirteen five, yeah, hmm. yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I mean it's crazy. I sold my dragons a long time ago. Um, I did not sell my little wars. I I have a full set of adventure gaming and a full set of Gygax. But uh, the dragon was just like, how much? Sure, hell yes. <laughs> So, so, and now uh, you're kind of like hmm, 13 five. no it was a good deal at the time and so you know life goes on it was a good, i didn't you know I, there's a couple people trying to shuck and jive me when i came back into the hobby in 2006. Mm -hmm. okay thank you jerry for the uh, the membership all right, guys, as always, we're going to establish the ground rules for the chat. Super chats in this channel, Zenith Comics Presents, will get priority. If you super chat in anybody else's channel, we will get to you. And if you just ask a question, we'll get to you at some point in the conversation. Uh, beyond that, anybody else got any questions for Tim? Let's, let's get, keep this ball rolling. I do. All uh, right. When you, uh, uh, you, you started out with the strategic review as the editor. What was like the transition like when you went over and, and did Dragon Magazine? Because you know I'm really familiar with Dragon and not so much Strategic Review. Well, uh, Strategic Review is what we used to call a newsletter simply because of its size and format. And it was you know several pages folded. Um, before I went to work there, uh, when I first got to talking and dancing around with Gary about possibly going to work there after I finished at college um which was like two quarters away he said he had this little newsletter i was familiar with it i'd you know i'd seen it i was getting it and he wanted to turn it into a full-fledged magazine and i said sure why not and uh, i was familiar with the rudiments of offset printing and folios and stuff like that because of a, a course i'd taken in junior college and so uh yeah okay let yeah okay on the condition that it had to be not a house organ i wasn't going to move my family up to wisconsin to publish a house organ well <laughs> over the ensuing conversations gary and i had after that initial one um we both agreed that we were going to put out a magazine with the philosophy of the rising tide lifts all boats and from that point on, Gary stepped aside and he never once ever interfered with me taking the review and spinning out on July 77 or 1977, 1976 with Dragon Number One. Never once, never once told me not to do anything, never once came in and hand me something, said print was, you know, everything in there that had his name on it, I thought was interesting. Every other article that I chose to publish, I chose just because, hey, I'll bet people like this. I um, I felt at the time that I had enough of a handle on what was the burgeoning game business to know what was going to be good and what people were going to be like 
and what people were gonna like. And I never once printed any negative reviews of any kind in Dragon Magazine. There was too many good things to talk about. And I was just like, hey, look at this one. Oh, check this out. You know, I was just having a ball doing it every other month at first, because then I did Little Wars on the off on the off, off months. So I was putting out a 32 page slick magazine at once a month by myself. And that's how I learned. And it got better and they got bigger. Um, the, when, I, when I was at Dragon, by the time we hit issue about 20, uh, it was all the printing and everything and paying the artists and the authors was, was already covered um, by the advertising because there were a zillion little companies. And whether it was a little ad or a half page or a full page or a back cover, their everything so certainly i'm going to run stuff about their product if it's good if it's good and if it's not i'll just thank them for their check and run their ad every every issue you know and so we were turning and burning real quick in terms of how long it takes to get off the ground and start turning a profit in fact it was probably more like because we did six and six and six. I think it was like the year that we combined the two, Little Wars into Dragon. We jumped another eight pages, I think, that issue. And I never added a folio or a half folio if I didn't have advertising, people that wanted to be in it to pay for it. I, I always had more ads than I could print, which is a <laughs> amazing position nowadays. But if you look back then, I was the only game in town. Mm -hmm. Of course, right, right. they were all going to come to my circus. How how oh, time consuming yeah. was it when you were doing the whole thing <clears throat> on your own? It's what I did all day. So that was your full time job. It wasn't a side. Oh yeah. Job. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, when we transitioned to Dragon in July, I had had my last involvement with D and D. Um. I'd done supplements. I'd written some for supplements. I spent a week, it literally locked, we locked ourselves in Gary's office and from it became basic and AD&D. &D. And then that was it. I backed away from the fantasy publishing part of the business because periodicals had plenty to keep me busy. Because by now, you know, we're doing calendars and we're doing best you know getting ready to do best ofs and stuff like this so i was plenty busy there speaking of which i got a copy of the old 1980 calendar <laughs> right here um <laughs> yeah and, and well i'm trying to reorganize organize my basement and so that when i go <laughs> whoever comes in to figure it out will have some somewhere to start um <laughs> but uh we 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 because then I hired Jake, then I hired Kim, Joe was in there, Corey was in there. They were Corey was doing more administrative stuff, handling subscription than that. Uh, Joe started doing that, and then he got more uh, he got more responsibilities. He became one of the uh, associate editors or something at one point. Um, and it was just a big sleigh ride. I mean, that picture on the back of that. Christmas dragon with us in the sleigh being pulled by the green dragons. That kind of is a, is a, it's kind of, let's see, it's kind of a metaphor for uh, the ride we were having. Hee <laughs> hee, let's go. And so uh, it was great fun. And then having learned there, I went on to do adventure gaming. And um, I like, uh, we were doing well, we were selling. But uh, we were losing small stores because we we're in the throes of Reaganomics by then. And over half the small hobby shops in the United States closed between 81 and 83 because they were mom and pop shops. And that was what we were relying on for circulation. So, okay, fold that tent. Several years later, I'm approached to do some consultancy on starting up a new magazine. And... Um, 
the Gygax brothers are involved in it. And then uh, we get like six issues out and the widow uh, killed it all. And um, to be honest, I, I don't know that Gygax magazine would have held on may, more than maybe a dozen issues because the market was changing, the productions, the productions were changing, advertising was not there, you know, advertising revenue was not there like it had been. Um, we mainly got what we got because it was big and splashy and some weird people on the on the East Coast were doing to me very embarrassing blogs and stuff. There was one with these two ladies, females. Oh my God. And they just they were way over the top. And I was embarrassed as hell because it was all about you know I'm involved in it. Well I only started out to be a consultant and um I was on the masthead just as a courtesy. Um but uh I don't know where we might have gone if the widow hadn't stopped in. You know, you guys were just a little bit away from the OSC explosion, and who knows, that could have carried you well because a lot of people would have started looking to advertise their products. I mean, I look, I was a Canadian back in the day. I still am, but back in the day when you were doing the magazine, and I would see these ads in Dragon for these games with this weird art, and I'd be like, I need this. And then each and every one of them without fail had – Continental U.S. only. Continental U.S. only. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, come on. Yeah. We're just over the border. I Wait, I, I, listen, you think that's bad. I had subscribers all right, that were in Canada. I had subscribers that were overseas. I ended up having to deal with customs, shipping magazines mm -hmm. out. So I ended up being the distributor for White Dwarf magazine for a while. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> just a distributor. That was it. And it was a... a, 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 a a, a huge ass pain. Um, Gygax Magazine, we had people railing at us from Britain and Australia about not being able to get it over there. Well, Jesus, a $20 magazine and they wanted $32 in postage. And that's not the U.S. Yeah. We pay what the home country wants. Yep. It's not us. I mean, people in, in, the, in the States don't realize what an amazing postal system we still have. Yeah, you and the Brits have the best. Uh, every time, I, I swear to God, it's insane. Canada, ours is garbage on toast, and I know Australia. Well, I mean, I'll give you an analogy of what it was like shipping stuff to Canada. It was shoving it in over the door and wondering you, when they get around to it. So I used to work for a distributor for cards, games, comics, magazines, and when we would pick up our border orders, it was a game of what can we hide at the bottom of the box that they're too lazy to look through that they would never let into Canada if they found it. Every oh. time. Every time. You know what I'm saying? So, well, no, I didn't get in any of those shenanigans. Well, we had no choice. I, I, I'd already gone through the satanic panic. So... <laughs> Wow, that was just during the height of Pokemon and anime, you know, so uh -huh. Uh -huh. everything was being critiqued by Canada Customs. Anywho, all right, gentlemen, Brian, you've been so quiet. You must have a question for the man. Well, yeah, so actually that that is, you, you just touched on one of the topics that I wanted to ask a question about, the whole satanic panic. What was the general vibe in the office when when all of that was going down? I remember what it was as a consumer and trying to defend, you know, the game and, and that, that I enjoyed playing to, you know, my parents, to uh, teachers, you know, in school. Just curious what the what vibe was, yeah. was laughter and smirking <laughs> because <laughs> free advertising. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have some opinions of my own. That woman that went on to uh, Tom Snyder show about her son. Commit well, I just yeah. think she was a shitty mother. And find, <laughs> find something to blame. <laughs> well, no, everything I've read about this woman, she was a crappy mother. Dallas Egbert, uh, you know, with his tragedies, he had the shittiest parents you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. No, he, he was, was like schizophrenic too. Like he had health. He had issues. chipped off to university. Yeah. 16 I mean, years he was old. A brilliant kid. I knew him. I'd met him. Yeah. He was a brilliant kid, but his mom and dad shipped him off to university. And hey, hey, we got the last one out of the house. Poor kid came home at Thanksgiving thinking he was going to have Thanksgiving dinner. The house is locked up. They're on a cruise. Yeah. He had yeah, to break yeah. in a basement window to get into his own home. Yeah. So, 
you know what and he never was in the steam tunnels and all yeah that was no. all bullshit but that one made the game the oh, sure. were bullshit in the steam tunnels all that crap the, the game just took off man the rocket lit and we all hung on hmm. and we, we were reprinting and re and, and bigger reprints and more frequent reprints we couldn't for a little while we couldn't handle the flow nice so there's no such thing as bad publicity now the satanic panic on the other hand was gee guess who fundamentalist christians that didn't have enough to do and they saw devils and demons and that the only concession we made to that hogwash was basic didn't have any of the high level demons or devils in it all right and, and the ones if you're careful and squint at them were they had a different name and you know so that was for little bright eyes to learn how to play the game with nothing in there that would offend mom gary's favorite retort to uh how we're weaving spells you know this shit is if you think it's real let me know where you spent the gold <laughs> yeah. I mean, all we gotta do is roll dice and we're rich you know uh, and that, that, you know i've used that i've used you know i've credited him every time but that's the best reply i ever heard i gotta say yeah you oh. know if you think this is real where's the money mm -hmm. fair enough and blackleaf i declare you dead you have to leave the game <laughs> jack, jack chick must have sold a hundred thousand copies oh, of for one you. year one year at the gen con auction um we got to clear the building thing from security oh so we got you know we got a packed audience in the auction and um everybody goes out onto the street because you know they're right there you're next to it large sidewalk and so um one of the auctioneers um guy his name will come to me in a minute um jumped up on a post and started reading chicks and the audience on one side of the street is and the and then they got this thing going going back and forth you know uh reciting the dialogue out yeah. of that thing and oh it was hilarious that's awesome a jack a jack track flash mob that's yeah. amazing yeah it, it kind of <laughs> was and uh yeah that's one of the stranger things i've seen at a game con wow just amazing. So, okay, so those early cons. Now, when did you well, start going to cons? Well, how, how, early. how early did First you start? One I going went to was in seventy-three. Okay, so I've seen pictures of some like the early Comic Cons and stuff like that, and like you know, people people complain about the cosplay they see today. They go, "It's so oh. sexualized." And then I see all these pictures of just women walking around with their tits out and dicks out, and I'm like, "What the hell?" Like, okay, the first know? I'll tell you the story of the first costumed person that came to gen con okay um it must have been i was working so it must have been 76 because we were still in the horticultural hall in lake geneva and this dude it was about six foot three yeah and weighed a good 240 250 some of it was muscle but and he had on a pair of, you know, bib overalls with one strap. <laughs> and he had orange yarn glued to the top of his bare feet. And a kind of a Lindsay Woolsey type shirt. And he was the first person that came dressed as a hobbit. The <laughs> <laughs> goddamn hobbit that ever lived. But that's what he was. That's what he, that was his take on the hobbit. He had the hair on the feet, you know, <laughs> the, the pants, the whole. Oh, uh, and, and he certainly wasn't the most. Well, he's still probably the most incongruous. But I've seen an awful lot of uh, costume players that were like, "No, you shouldn't have worn that." Uh, <laughs> both males and females. Well, good news is you can um, still see that. Today. I used to be amused. I would go out and watch the the parade at uh, Gen Con when I was still going to Gen Cons. And it was pretty amusing because some of those people had just astonishing costumes and you could see they were handmade and that. And 
<laughs> I admire the kind of fervor that goes into that because they're obviously passionate about wherever that character came from, whether it was steampunk or, or fantasy or, you know, um, post apoc you know, something, wherever it came from. Uh, now, that said, I do think a lot of them look silly. I don't think they're as bad as some of the ones I see at Comic-Con. And some of those, I think those are mostly silly. Um, however, then the, we had the guy that was inside a power armor suit that worked. I mean, he's about five feet across and about eight feet tall. And we climbed into that thing and he was dying. He was like wearing Speedos. He'd come out and he was just drenched, <laughs> you know, because it was a warm August day in Indiana. And uh, wow. so, so, I mean, I've, yeah, and then there's the ladies, females. Or, well, I'll, yeah, we're not going into what we call <laughs> um, that. Uh, so as an excuse to wear next to nothing. Yeah, and a couple of them, I was grateful. And <laughs> many, many more of them, I was like, oh no, I didn't need to see that. Come on. The, uh, the worst <laughs> I ever saw was at uh, Montreal Comic Con one year. This guy showed up. We saw pictures of it because I don't go. But uh, this guy was basically. Elvis, the Vegas years, but as one of the the battle, one of the three hundred from Thermopylae. So he he had the speedo and he had the oh you know, everything, but he was he was the guy was like three hundred and fifty pounds. You know what well, I mean? Hilarious. I, I don't know if I admire or I'm puzzled by the chutzpah it takes to dress up like that and go out in public. Big chutzpah, big chutzpah. I don't have it. Okay, I mean no. I wear my cap when I'm doing my and you know, and stuff like that, but I don't do costumes. And I had conflicts with the, um, uh, who's the guys that beat each other up with foam swords? Um, I've had conflicts with them all, all, all through the, the beginnings of D&D &D because uh, they were claiming to be, they, was, they were probably the first LARPers, but before yeah. that they were creative anachronism, society of creative anachronism. And uh, they just took to D&D &D like, oh, limpets. <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> it, it 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 got to the point where I was railing against. And this is back when I was doing adventure gaming. After I'd left, I was railing against some of the sexist exhibitions they were putting on, like in front of the the in front of the kind of center, you know, or whatever. So everybody had to see them. And, you know, hey, if you guys want to go out there in the hot sun and beat, beat each other senseless with padded sticks, I'm okay. But we didn't need the TNA that, you, you know, you could have had another reason for him to be fighting, not rescuing the princess who was wearing about what Princess Leia wore when she was chained to Jabba. But yeah. Leia wore it better. Yeah, because it was more like Jabba wearing it. I get it. But, oh. Well, no, I mean, just uh, Leah, she pulled that suit off. This this girl, oh, not quite. Yeah, there there is a level of audacity that I sometimes see in the cosplay world. Not that I think it's bad, because because there's some amazing. No, it's cosplayers. fervor. It's it's enthusiasm. Yeah, and as long as they don't begin to think they're those characters, you know, there's there's okay. no harm. Um, have you ever read the book? Kind of going out and beating up people or shooting people or fair, getting fair. beat up or getting shot. You know, I mean, or hiding in the steam tunnels. Yeah, uh, did you yeah. ever read the book uh, Bimbos of the Death Sun? No. It's a really funny book about a murder mystery that happens at a, a, a sci-fi fantasy convention. Oh, it Lord. is a fantastically funny read. Like it's really well done. What's it called again? Bimbos of the Death Sun. Bimbos. Okay, I know what bimbos are. <laughs> <laughs> One of them fancy words. You got to look them up. No, uh, no, I, I use that word a lot. <laughs> First out with you, ignorant bimbo, when somebody cuts me off in traffic or whatever. I'm a very, verb, I'm a very verbal driver. I can imagine. I, well, are. I'd rather just shout it out than bottle it up. Fair. No, hundred percent fair. I, I echo what uh, someone else said in the chat, which is I'd like to be adopted by you because you are the curmudgeon grandfather I never had. So perfect. Well done. Well, I have, um, I now have seven 
great grandchildren. Oh, I had two children. Each of them had two children. Well, my son's two children haven't even started. They, I don't think any of them are even serious about anybody. But my daughters, too, have uh, six between them. And I have a seventh that we've brought into the family because he's half brother. Okay. To two that are fully mine. So he's like, you know, he gets an Easter basket. He gets Christmas presents. You know, he's part of the clan. Six of them are blood. And um, the seventh one has been brought into the family. Wow. <laughs> and they range in age from 10 to four weeks. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I get to see her again this Saturday. Oh, uh, we're wow. doing Easter at Sa on Saturday at our house so that they can go, they go do things on Easter yeah. with their families. So the the other real question family. is how, how soon do you get them into D&D? Well, um, my uh, nine-year-old granddaughter can pull all three story dice out of a bag and whip you a story just like that. Nice. Excellent. So you have done your duty. Good. Well, she, it, well as soon as we get her to focus, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the few things she will focus on, and she tends to ramble on. But um, she's uh, capable of, well, what? I think story dice are the greatest invention since sliced bread for DMs mm -hmm. because they're mental exercises. Yeah. Pull, you know, get, I've got a bag with about 40 of them, you know, all kinds of weird sets. And I just pull one out and pull three out, roll them. And it's a good way to make hooks. It's like, it's like, you know, warming up in the bullpen. Yeah. And it just gets, gets my mind agile and maybe thinking, you know, and I think any DM, that wants to be better it will teach you how to turn right when you thought they were going to turn left nice i really do couple three sets you'll need to really you know make it weird you'll need a medieval set and then one with rockets and other things you know because it with my great granddaughter okay and i finally had to limit her in time with a timer because she couldn't go she was doing seven eight minutes and she's almost the end, and I point to the third one, which she hasn't gotten in there way yet. She goes, and I was just getting to that and spins it right off into the third die. <laughs> so the kids got the mental agility. Yeah. You know, and that's what my wheel of blame game is. It's all ad lib. And um, that's why we have so much fun, because I'm not, you know, I'm not there to kill you or even care if you kill anything. But we are going to have some fun. We are going to have some laughs, and we are going to think outside the box. Nice. I figure that's my my mission is to get people to laugh again and to think outside the box. Nice. Because in the old the way I play, somewhere between OD and D and first edition, everything boy that twenty sider gets warmed up. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it used a lot. All right, give me a twenty. They don't even know what for. <laughs> but. Okay, and they, they get a low roll. Well, I guess that didn't work. Or, you know, I guess you didn't see that and slip, you know, whatever. But yeah. I just get them jumpy, but rolling 20, rolling 20. Why? Just roll a 20, I'll tell you. And then while they're all rolling, I said, roll beneath your decks. Roll over your strength, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> and um, that's real old school. Lots of dice rolling. Not lots of multiple dice. So I do favor D4s. Took six D fours worth of damage. That's a mighty smack. Tim, can we see that painting again, if, if you don't mind? I'd like to show it to everybody. There you go. I want to get, get rid of the glare. That's okay. Oh, it looks good. Looks yeah. good. Yeah. That's now what, good. Now, what's the story on that guy? Well, that's Jeru. Well, now he's Uraj. Um, and uh, oh, I got a painting back here. This is in first or second dragon. Oh, hang on a second. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me get you up there. Big it's on the very screen. early dragon. Oh, wow. Kind of looks nice. like Vladimir Putin. <laughs> no, that was, that was done by Bill Hannon, who did uh, the original logos for both Little Wars and uh, Dragon. And he did a couple of covers for me, including the front one. Um, and uh, you know, the front one was very bare and spare. 
for a reason. The name, the dragon. What's in the center there? A dragon. If that wasn't going to get anybody to pick it up, <laughs> but we've been plugging the shit out of it in the last couple of episodes or issues of Strategic Review. I've been teasing it for a couple of episodes. First time I had a little bar block and just the tip of dragon's nose, nothing else, just a white space. And the next one, the dragon's nose was out about halfway and had a couple of you know, wrinkles in the nose, like an alligator would, and uh, just a wisp of steam coming out of one nostril. And yeah, we've been teasing it. Nice. Um, Kabuki so. Kid wants to know, uh, is there anything, any story about the coloring for that original dragon cover? Well, <clears throat> yeah, um, it was all cut lithographs. We started, that was all black and white when we started. Yeah. And so we cut lithographs for the wings and for the body, just the old, uh, whatever that translucent colored crap was. Yeah. Um, I'm lithograph might be the wrong name. Um, but that, that was just, uh, cut with, you know, the colors were cut with a razor and, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was very primitive because, uh, I hadn't quite mastered a full color front cover yet. And I didn't want to press my printer real hard on the first issue. So, um, and I, I liked the spare style. It was not what was becoming increasingly popular that you're seeing on the side of vans and stuff. Yeah. I liked the spare <laughs> style. And, uh, there's been a couple of homages drawn to it that are, are very nice. Um, I like the first logo, the dragon, with all its little embellishments and everything. Um, but uh, that that went away after I did. So uh, you know, they slimmed it down, made it easier to print. I don't know. It's a shame because that was so, a little, you know, they dropped the the. Oh, well, still the same magazine that I started. So this is the one we're talking about here, right? Yep. Yeah, and those were lithographs. Now, if you look at the green, you'll see a couple of slits where the yeah. white shows through. The wings were cut with another one, and the back was kind of like spray painted. Oh, okay. Except I don't know what with. I think that was might have been airbrushed by the printer. I'm not sure. Huh. I, just oh, I think it's fair to I see, you know I got to see a proof of it and I said oh hell yes <laughs> and we went with it. sure yeah yeah look Tim I think it's fair to say that Dragon Magazine did a great deal of heavy lifting for people who were getting into D&D &D and helping us learn how to run the game and have ideas and you know things like that I, I don't think there's anyone that played D&D &D back in the 80s or even the late 70s that wasn't you know Dragon Magazine when that magazine came out you just digested the whole issue well i've had people tell me they drive 75 miles and me pissed off because it didn't come in the day it was supposed to oh, yeah. yeah and this is 40 years later and they're still pissed off and i was hey yeah. i said i came to the mailman you know, the same time <laughs> as everybody else Not what's me. your favorite uh mega issue you ever put out um, i'll have to think on that all right i've got a few favorite articles that i did sure Let's go. No, I, I I couldn't wait to publish the nine point alignment system. Mm. I love that. That's that was always the way that I played, and we sort of Gary sort of played because it, there's a lot of fudging around on what's you know what side of you on as a you know because originally lawful and chaotic originally in the original books now the little ones. Lawful and chaotic were used to describe behaviors. Yeah. Elves were chaotic because they were capricious. They did what they wanted. Orcs were pretty lawful in that they followed the same patterns. They reacted to the same things. And that's what lawful and chaotic meant when the book was first written or the game was first written. That's what it meant. That morphed into, okay, and ended up in the nine-point alignment system, which is okay if the DM wants to beat his players over the head when they screw up. <laughs> it, it's it's not arbitrary. It's right there. Yeah. You know, and it, it allows for a lot of side fun 
you get really screwed up with, you know, I don't go into detail on your deities or anything like that. I don't care. Okay. You make up a name and what is he? Okay. He's, he's lawful good. Okay. That's fine. And I, that's it from there on. I don't hammer you with, well, Gary would hammer you with resurrections and cures and, oh, oh, Jesus, he would hammer you with that. You know, all of a sudden, your your character is just, you know, he's out for weeks of game time. Or you were on weeks of game time trying to go get him resurrected. Um, I, was, I, I didn't go there. Um, I once ran a game in a basement in Kansas City. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't know it at the time, but all the players were ex-cons and had learned <laughs> in prison. I was about to say, I was about to ask that. Well, and the guy that is guy whose house it was, he was not an ex-con. He was the only, <clears throat> pardon me, he was the only one who wasn't. And so, okay, the way I do that is I give out pregens that have a tight alignment channel. And so this guy wanted, he's, he, I made him a paladin. Okay, he's got to go around and smack people. When, when they're getting out of line. And I said, that's your job. You've got to stick up your butt, and this is your job. And I figured this is the most fun way to play, to handle this guy, because my friend had already told me he was a little wild. So we got to a point where he's going to, he wants to poke eyeballs out of baby orcs to get answers. <laughs> and, I, and, and I said, no, 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 you can't. What do you mean I can't? I said, no, you can't do that. And so he stands up on his side of the table. <laughs> and so I stand up on my side of the table, you know, knuckles down like apes. And I go, you can't do that. And he leans in toward me. And so I point at where the imaginary sign of his God that I told him he had at the beginning of the game. I said, because that won't let you. He backed off. And we <laughs> went on. We played another couple of hours. Um, so beating them with a, with a alignment thing can be fun and useful if you need it. I, I don't, you know, I don't say, you know, indiscriminately beat them. That's no fun, but, uh, it's there to use if you want. And the nine point alignment system made that took all the guesswork out of it. No, I'm Fair. a fan of the nine point alignment you system. Know? And so many people didn't understand that the original uses, if you look back in the Three Little Round books, chaotic and lawful were used to describe monsters mm -hmm. and races. Monsters, well, actually, races is superfluous. Back then, monsters were anything that wasn't a player character. Right? Mm -hmm. It was just real easy. Monsters, that was everything. They could run from a, a, a goblin picking his nose to some horrible undead thing that's you know you know they're all monsters so nowadays very, very, very to uh, ascension creature is a monster is offensive well now we're going into that so jay taylor would like to know if you have any stories about the creation of the bullet the boulet the bullet oh, <laughs> um, i published the correct pronunciation with the monster in july yeah. of 1976 okay. dragon number one Boo lay. Why? Because I said so. Fair enough. <laughs> I think it's, well, that's not what the French would say. I'm not French. I was speaking French at the time because De Gaulle was being a pain in the ass and wouldn't let NATO fly over France at the time to go do something they really needed to do. And I, you know, at that period in time, I did not like France or the French because, you know, you couldn't order a hamburger. You had to have, say it in French. They were they kept the language pure, you know, and uh, the French in Canada were just as bad. <laughs> Canadian Canuck, they were just as bad for a while there. It looked like I was going to have to print both the French and English on the cover. Uh, I live in Quebec. Uh, I, grew I, up I ignored that. it and, I and it blew over. But yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah I, I live in the legacy of uh, the Gauls. Vive la Quebec Libre. Trust me. Anyway, the boulette. Boulet. Boulet, pardon, pardon <laughs> moi. I'm gonna hang up if you can. Land shark, God damn it's a land shark. Good, yes. What's the story of its creation? Is I think what. Um, no. I did not. I am. 
back in this period of time, half page ads were generally sent as negatives. And one got mangled in the uh, mail, the snail mail got it got mangled. So I was a day and a half away. It was uh, Friday night. It came Friday. And uh, I was going to press to print on Monday. So um, I got a half page. We had planned to start Creature Features in number two with the Catoblapa. So I had already uh, I had already had that one set aside and already mostly laid out, as a matter of fact. And so I came, went into Gary and I said, uh, open the box, open the drawer, because in the bottom drawer, he had all the little original monsters. Yeah. And I said, OK, which one hasn't been used by you guys? And he looked around and there was one that was really dorky. And there was the the belay, which they had, had only seen twice. It had run down the hallway and knocked everybody over. So they hadn't even fought it or anything. I said, okay, that's okay. So I took it home. At the time, the game, I, I will speak about the game uh, and, and it's cloud-like. Uh, the game was overrun with hobbits and dwarven ponies. <laughs> Somebody in one of the fanzines had read back and found out that in 1846, some Welsh mine had two ponies that worked down in the mines. So, <laughs> well, hell, now we can take dwarves on, we can take pony or, um, you know, ponies on adventures through the dungeon. They can look underground's no problem. So, pretty soon, dwarven ponies were proliferating all across the game land. And uh, everybody, have it this, have it that, have it this, have it that. And we were not enormous fans of Tolkien, aside from whatever personal enjoyment we got, because everybody had to be Legolas, or they had to be Aragorn, you know, or they had to be one of the, one of the you know, and we, so way too many. So I said, okay, here we go. I got a monster that burrows underground, Loves to dig hobbits out of their burrows and eat them. And dwarven ponies are the next best thing. And so I, I had DM saying they had thinned the herd of both. <laughs> and I have, a, I have a, a small diorama over here on one of my shelves that won a, a gold feather or gold prize, gold whatever it is at uh, Gen Con. And the lady who did it turned around and handed it to me after she took it out of the display case and just gobsmacked me. And it is a boule bursting out of the side of a wall going after a hobbit who still has a spraying pan in his hands and the eggs and bacon are slipping out under the ground. Nice. <laughs> She's one of the best painters in the world and just, oh yeah, okay. So yeah, I have a boule preparing to dine. Okay. Another so question that, from the that's uh, why that monster came out with those abilities, yeah, to address what we saw was an imbalance in the game. Just like I invented psionics because there was no defense against thought eaters and brain moles and the mind flares. Before the boule, nothing puckered up or <laughs> made you pucker up like a mind flare because they took away permanent stats, yeah. And if they got you long enough, you can just throw that guy away and roll up a new one because he just <laughs> threw it on himself. <laughs> and barely walk. Shadow and Sun says, hey, Tim, I got to ask, what did you think of the Arduin Grimoire back in the day? Meh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest. Meh. Not, not much, one way or the other. Um, I was friends with some of those. That, that was from... Uh, Stafford and um, they're still in business. What is that company? Um, anyway, Meh. I okay. was so busy. I was so busy with what I was doing. Even after I stepped away from the D and D production, that it had to be pretty spectacular to catch my attention, and um, I gave space to non-TSR games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and lots of space. Nobody could ever say I was one-sided in that regard. Usually if there were there were 10 articles in there, maybe two of them would be about two different TSR games and the other eight were all about other people. 
and other stuff. Um, okay. It, it, it's, it's an interesting piece of writing and compilation. But I never saw the necessity to adopt it into my world. Fair enough. Doc Flamingo for $5 says, what was the first game outside of TSR that was viewed as serious competition in terms of quality? Well, we thought that Traveler might, but we were wrong there. And how can any game where you might die while you're rolling up the character hold an audience very well? <laughs> Um, we we sent out C and Ds to s small, and I cannot recall all those because I wasn't involved in that. But I know we did. Um, the biggest competition we had was a goddamn Xerox machine. <laughs> People were fo were photocopying the whole damn book, and we weren't getting a dime. And we were a small growing company, and uh, we went after those people. In fact, uh, poor Jim Ward uh, was tasked a couple of years with going around and busting people that had the great big piles of Xerox because they were illegal. So uh, that that was a good game that might compete with us. I really don't recall anything. And I was there 75 to 80. I really don't recall anything that I thought was like, whoa. Fair. I really I really don't. Um, Not bunnies and burrows? No? No. I, I love the guy that, I love the professor who wrote it. And I think it's a funny game. I think it's wonderful to play a couple, three times. <laughs> and then if you're either into it or you're not. And it's very, it, it's fun to get into for a couple of games because how far, far, how far, far, you know, their, 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 their ability to judge distances and stuff. No. It, it shows a lot of knowledge about rabbits or conies or, you know, any of the related. And, um, he, you know, Dennis did a wonderful job in that regard. It didn't, the, the the craze is to my knowledge did not last the big numbers did not last more than a year or two i know there are still people that play it i know there's people that play it once in a while just for fun just for the heck of it um and you know that's a that's it anybody that's going back after this period of time and still playing it even once in a while shows that that person at least feels that game has quality and staying power. Fair. But I really don't remember anything that we thought was going to be seriously, because I guess they really swatted enough people with small people with the C and D's. Um, we, we, we laughed our asses off when uh, <laughs> SPI came out with their fantasy board game thing and it <laughs> stunk too many corners to too complex <laughs> rules. Yeah. Um, Avalon Hill tried a couple, three times to do something no. until they bought uh, Titan from Dave Trampier. They, they, they missed every time. Tide was a good game. Outside I, of, played, uh... I played Titan before it had been written up. I played a demo game in the dirt under a tree with Dave and Jason. Hey, we got to show you this game idea we got. <laughs> so we got stoned. <laughs> it could be, it could be both, you know, it's like six thirty. We went out there, and he had a, a pocket full of army men, and we picked up some sticks and twigs. Okay, and the twigs are this and that. And he showed me the weird woman system, and I'm going like, "Whoa!" I sound like anything I've ever seen. The only problem with Titan was it was very complex rules. A good game, if you both knew the game well. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful intricate strategy game but it was a tough learn it was a high you had to you had to climb a high hill to learn how to use that one now so after dragon we see stuff like white dwarf we see challenge magazine we see a bunch of imitators come along essentially trying to sort of vie for the crown right well white dwarf competed white dwarf competed with us 
in Britain while from the get go. Yeah, yeah. They, they might have jumped in a couple three months after, uh, or no more than six months later, they started publishing. Okay. Um, and so they were because it was so difficult to get them over there. Um, they were the the dragon of in, in the UK. Sure. And Gary and Ian, you know, they got together and um, proceeded to put out the silliest book of all. Um, you can guess what that is, but uh, anything that's got a flump in it is silly. <laughs> be the fiend folio by any chance? Uh, oh yes, FF. <laughs> Though I have, uh, I have a different word uses of the two Fs. <laughs> <laughs> Foolish fuckery is what it is, <laughs> you know. And if you if you watch a lot of British humor, this would appeal to Brits. Well, some of it. But if you don't watch a lot of British humor, you're just going to sit there and scratch your ass. A big marshmallow that can take you out. What? We loved it. I'm telling you, in high school, we loved that. Book. Well, we always we 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 had a problem of feeding ideas out, and Dragon Magazine was as much that as anything else. We published Blackmore to show people, hey, you can do this really neat temple, and you can work it all out and everything, and you can make that the center of your game. Oh, here's another race with the hogging. All right, and we kept chunking out ideas to help people build up their campaigns to flesh them out and uh, i published fiction that was hated at first and then when i stopped it i hey, where's the fiction? Blah, 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 blah. and i was only publishing the fiction well number one i got to republish a gardener fox story that had been out of print for 45 years i got to reprint it a fritz a fritz liber story they've been out of print for gazillion years uh elspragg to camp you know who that read fantasy back then wouldn't have published this stuff if they had the opportunity mainly because it's ideas here's stuff to mine steal adapt because we were still pushing that that thought you know that's appendix n was put together to say this is what we read this is where our ideas came from. Okay, you can read it, you can not. You know, read Three Hearts and Three Lions. Oh, there's the paladin. You know, that is the, the genesis of the paladin. Gary loved that book, so did I at the time. Um, so he, he formed the genesis and became the paladin. Bio break, I know what that means. <laughs> So, Tim, I got a question about uh, this stuff, the white box, right, and all these supplements. Now, yeah. I don't – you you came in after the white box came out, but I'm of no, understanding. No, I oh, did, did not. Okay. Oh, God, no, I, I assembled enough of those goddamn brown boxes. Oh, oh, no. Well, I didn't know that. But I did have a question about the writing of the supplements, and I know that you had a – Piers, you had a little bit more involvement in these than we're led to believe, right? Well, um, I had a lot of involvement in them. The, the supplements were put out. Greyhawk is easy. That was everything that Gary couldn't get into the first books because we were numbered. We were limited by the number of pages that we could print. Yeah. Blackmore was a sop to Dave Arneson. Here, mm -hmm. Dave, you can have a supplement. Yeah. And uh, he didn't like it, but he still cashed all the checks. Right. <laughs> um, and so, let's see, what came next? Eldritch Wizardry? Um, yeah, that almost killed the brand. That book almost killed the brand because so. hobby shops were sealing it back, little mom and pop shops were sealing it back up and sending it back to us. Yeah. Um, the, the joke is that it was drawn by a 15 year old girl. Right. Well, I didn't yeah. know that till 10 years later, <laughs> 20 years later, I guess. But yeah, it was drawn by a girl, but they thought it was okay. Well, that's part of the, you know, demons and naked ladies and, you know, right. mom, you know, so um, we uh, learned the hard way. Don't go there if we can't help it. And there was God's demigods. I'll tell you where God's demigods and heroes come from, came from exactly. 
All right. Like I said, the other stuff we were trying to ride herd on the crowd and, the, and, and give them good ideas and keep them from going down to alleys. God's demigods and heroes came from a letter we received. We used to take turns, Brian and Gary and I, whose week is it to read fan letters or <laughs> you know, questions? Because as it was always the case with the old board games, in the back, you got a question, type it out on a single piece of paper, enclose a self-addressed stamped envelope, and somebody will answer it for you. Hmm. All right? <laughs> so um, we, we, we did, you know, we got those kinds of letters. Well, this was a, oh, this was, very neatly printed, probably three sides of a page, you know, page and a half or three pages, whatever. And um, the guy was lamenting the fact that he didn't know what they were going to do the next time they got together because they had just essentially trashed Valhalla. <laughs> yeah. They had destroyed the Bifrost Bridge <laughs> and killed Odin. Mike and I'm reading you. this, you know, my, uh, and I start to <laughs> chuckle. And I'm just chuckling and chuckling and chuckling. And finally, because our, our office doors were only a little ways apart from each other, uh, yeah. Gary goes, what the hell are you giggling about in there? And I said, well, listen to this. Brian, come out here. So I got him standing there, and I started reading it. <laughs> and pretty soon, what? Oh. <coughs> Gary's nearly swallowed his tongue by now. So that's when we decided, okay, Odin's got 600 hit points. And this is before AD&D reminding. Yeah, yeah. Odin's got 600 hit points. Go kill him now, you little turds. <laughs> <laughs> you always got 600 hit points. And then we got the other pantheons. And, you know, it was a, all right, now try that again. What kind of wimps were you fighting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't care if you're all, back then in the day, if you were a 12th level, you were badass. I don't care if the whole damn party was 12th level. They shouldn't have been able to take out Valhalla. Yeah. Oh, man, they killed the Valkyries, too. <laughs> I mean, they literally depopulated Valhalla. Well, not the next time. <laughs> <laughs> and so we published Gods, Demigods, and Heroes. For that reason, at that time, now it proved to be very popular, which led to deities and demigods, which was yeah. a, the next step up in potency and power and you know purview. Um, so uh, that came directly out of some group somewhere. I don't even remember where the, the letter was from that had wiped out Valhalla on a weekend, like seven-hour adventure. <laughs> So were you involved in the deities and demigods that that first draft you weren't? I was curious yeah. about the the decision to I was I was awesome. out of I was out of D&D &D then. I was right. I was no longer in production. Yeah. I was in periodicals. I was no longer in uh, TSR games. I had nothing to do because if we did, we had to pay each other. Cuz right. we each had separate budgets and we had to write checks. So um so you don't have any that. behind the scenes scoop on on the decision to include the chaosium stuff, the Cthulhu and the Melvin Banan that they had to remove? Um, nobody consulted me. I was not privy to the decisions. I do believe that having had uh, some interesting things go on with my me in the magazine and asking permissions and whatever, if they'd asked me, I said, I think you better check that out. I think it's public domain, it's not what you could think it is. And uh, so they had to pull it, which has made the first books more valuable. And it was yeah. a lesson learned in TSR that they weren't omnipotent. But I had nothing what to do with that. Nothing. Right. I, I, didn't had... even, I wasn't even in on one of the bull sessions about what pantheon should we include. Because so if I had, had copy... we'd have had Incas and Mayas in there. You talk about valuable. I had a copy of it in high school, grade 10. And uh, I had the one with the Melna Bonet and Cthulhu and all that. And a buddy of mine found out. Ants. It. it had ants. It had ants, yeah. And, and buddy hobbits, not halflings. Hobbits. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. My they buddy they wanted it. Up all over. begged me for it. And finally, I traded it to him for a carton of cigarettes. Oh. <laughs> and, and now that's about a $2,000 carton yep. of cigarettes. But man, that carton of cigarettes did me well in grade 10. So I was a good, like you were talking about with the Dragon Magazine, it was a fair trade at the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, this Who is knew? 2K now? What? <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Nobody knew. There Sorry, I go. dropped something. I had to see if it's important. I better keep this one intact. It's my niece's inheritance. <laughs> well, talking about uh, Blackmore and Dave Arneson, you were around when Dave Arneson was floating around. What, what was your view on Dave and what was his involvement back then? Uh, I don't want to trash a dead guy. Yeah, no, I don't. Dave had great ideas and almost no organizational skills or communication skills to explain these ideas. Yeah. A lot of what I did in black, they literally, true story, I got a peach basket about this big, about that tall for a half pack or whatever it was. And it was full of pieces of paper, some typed, some handwritten couple of different uh what some in cursive some in printing and no idea what the hell they were about <laughs> so i literally i took that home that's why we i was using the spare bedroom um i took those home and i spread them out all over the floor and kept the cat out and tried to figure out what i had so it was pretty easy to figure out with the temple and I found myself having to write about 30%, 25 or 30% to stitch the pieces together, sketch, sketch ideas together. Um, I printed uh, Dave, uh, Stephen Marsh. Uh, I printed his Sahagan people. Yeah. I printed the... Uh, I included the Temple of the Frog, mm -hmm. and about 30% of all the rest of that I had to write to weave it together. And yeah. that was my baptism under fire of writing something a gamer wrote. <laughs> Dave was cruel, <laughs> mean spirited, and um, very dismissive. That said, TSR screwed the pooch when they tried to hose him out of first edition. Yeah. Never should have gone there. I said so at the time, and I was told to shut up. I'm in periodicals. Okay. Didn't have enough stock to force the issue. Okay. Um, Dave had great ideas. He yeah. was mean-spirited. Um, after every issue came out, um, we always had got them on Fridays. Everybody took one home, and he came in on Monday and with all the typos or whatever <laughs> circled and tell me, oh, 12 donuts. Now, when you're the one guy writing it, proofing it, and then proofing it again, you know, that's why I brought in more people to prove so we could proof each other. But I asked him, I said, well, you know, I could, I could certainly use some help in this division, and I could even, you know, pick up part of your check. Oh, no. that's not what I'm here for. But I never did figure out why he was there because he left after several weeks. And then I found out he told shitty stories about me that weren't true for years yeah. afterwards. I was a drugger. I was a druggie. I had uh, passed out in his favorite uh, recliner and burned a hole in it. Well, that recliner I looked at real hard for. I sat down in it the first time. I wasn't sure it was going to hold me. You know, he just told hateful stories that I was even unaware of at the time. Hmm. But that just goes to show how small a person he apparently was. I don't, you know, that's what I know of him. That's how I dealt with him. And that's then fair. he shit all over me. Yeah, it's your experience. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, before we uh, started the show, you were mentioning that you are okay now with talking about why you left TSR. Would Sorry. you mind sharing that with us? Well, whatever. Uh, you have, you read, have you read any of the excellent books that had been put about about the uh, days of TSR. There yes. came a time when Gary no longer had majority interest in the shares. For a while, about a year and a half, Bloom's had so much, Gygax had so much, they each had to give me a, the same number of shares when I came into the company. So all of a sudden, Tim's got the balance. If the Blooms and the Gygaxes were at odds, I usually came down with Gary because Gary had better instincts on what might sell than Brian 
Brian was a bean counter. Hmm. All right. And so when they got, when they got control, I was the first to go. They offered me a position. They offered, I was pulled out of periodicals and told I could go work under a person I despise to this day uh, for much less money. I said, screw you. I resigned. And so I resigned that day. Um, it was years later that I found out that Gary had been out maneuvering that because he sat there the whole time looking miserable and never opened his mouth. And it was only years later that I found out why. Now, after they canned me for being his confidant, they canned Mincer. They canned um, anybody that seemed to get close to Gary got fired at some point because the Bloom saw him as a threat. Right. Yeah. And usually because Gary had people working with him that had gaming brains, game brains, you know, they knew what they were doing. So um, that's why I left. Mm -hmm. uh, the people at Ralph Parler said, hey, uh, you want to do another magazine? Um, we'll move you down. We'll, we'll pay to move you down here and uh, you can, we'll get together and they'll they'll put up the money and I'll make a magazine. And so I moved my family to Cincinnati and uh, went to work down there and we got 13 issues out um, until, like I said earlier, uh, we were we were one of many victims of Reaganomics when it didn't trickle down as far as us. Yeah. 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 For you sure. know, um, we lost uh, countless distributors, small mom and pop shop distributors. And just, I would find, you know, I'd sell 80 copies and lose 90, hmm. you know, I'm hustling, 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 finding new places to put it. And I'd lose, you know, I'd, I was just, a, and I am trying lost a few thousand of my own money. I said, screw it. Yeah. How do you feel about the direction Dungeons and Dragons has gone since your time at the entire end of TSR Watsi and where we are today? Like, do you have any thoughts about the whole process of the evolution? Oh, sure. We can start with the editions. Sure. First edition, mm -hmm. AD&D obviously started it. Second edition, I thought was a good job of cleaning up typos and making clarifications. Why somebody thought they needed a third is beyond me. 3.5 was an absolute piece of filth and not because it had any purient interest in it whatsoever. It's just a piece of garbage. Four became a pinball game on the tabletop. Oh, gee, you just ran into four orcs. Well, shit, there goes the next two and a half hours. <laughs> That's how long it was going to take to resolve it. Now, having said that on those, Five's another kettle of fish entirely. Five revamped it and attracted a whole lot of new players. And for that, I salute them. Not my D&D, &D, but it is d and &D. It is the, still the descendant of the d, &D I helped Gary write. So, and it's brought a lot of new players and new interests. So now, yeah. some of the shit online, like that critical role. Oh, God. How, why do people watch other people play in a game? I, I don't know. The other I don't know. Why would you? Yeah, why would well, you do if, that? If the people playing the game are half ass actors that can't get a real job. Okay. I've never understood that dynamic ever, 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 ever. However, I'm right there with you. I'm seeing a lot of five people taking an interest in going back. I get questions like, is it true you can really die if a poisonous <laughs> snake bites you? I, you know, and dies like in bold caps. And I'm going, yes. And if you make your saving throw, you still get half damage for what it did to your nervous system. And the guy just shriveled. Oh. He just couldn't wrap his hand because I understand in five e there's about three rolls you got to fail mm -hmm. to actually die. That's bullshit. That I don't like. However, it did generate a lot of interest. That third roll kept him in the game. All right, from a marketing point, if I were a historian looking back, I'm sure that had a part of it. But I'm seeing a lot of them taking interest in old school. Now, whether it's 
early edition D and D, Swords and Wizardry, which is a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful set of rules and a wonderful book. And I'm not at all prejudiced, even though I wrote a introduction to one of the printings. I wouldn't have if it wasn't. Yeah. You know, I'm friends with the guy who did it. If I didn't like his book, I'd have declined politely. Um, so in that regard, it's probably been a boon. Next year or so, we'll, we'll see how that boon shakes out. If the interest in going back and playing the old way dies off in a year, it was just a flash in a pan. Well, it's not dying off. I don't see that either yet. But mm -hmm. hey, remember, I was one of the chief big money auctioneers at Gen Con. I remember the year that all of a sudden we got 80 vampire books. Two, hour, two years after vampires became a big thing, that lasted less than two years. And yeah. everybody was selling their vampire rule books. Yeah. So chicken last year and a half or so, and then just somebody pokes a needle in the balloon. Michael Chad for five dollars says, "Thank you, sir, for pioneering our hobby." You're more than welcome. Sure. My God, we had a good time doing it. I did at least. I had a good time doing it. Now, as a whole ass actor who's gotten lots of work, <laughs> allow me to say that I love your opinion on that one because it is honestly how I feel about ninety nine percent of people who do live play as well. That so, as, a, <laughs> it, it, I, I, as, as much of a hypocrite as it makes me, because I do run live plays here on the channel, I completely understand, and I do not understand the appeal of critical role. I never... All right, can I tell you about a, a, a project? Um, we're sure. we're waiting. <laughs> um. The the shithead in Lake Geneva that had uh, you know the museum and all that. If you follow those, mm -hmm. those cards, mm -hmm. he's been screwing with my partner Don Samora. He dropped a dime to customs and said there was contraband in our pallet. So we lost our whole first printing. Jesus Christ! And uh, so we have a second printing now. We're still waiting to clear out of customs for the last three and a half months. The game is called D20 Delving. All small, all, all minuscules, as we would say. Um, it's all minuscules, and it's a better version of the old TSR dungeon game. Okay, move, yeah, yeah. Move around some squares, yeah, yeah. in a room, whatever. Now, the game has, uh, also like dungeon, a buttload of cards. That was the worst thing about the old dungeon game. It took you 15 minutes to get all the cards where they had to go. So all our cards, monsters, traps, treasures, rooms, whatever, have a QR code. And when you scan it with your phone, you'll hear me read it. Oh, neat. We are aiming this at sight impaired, including them into the fold. Here's a game. Sure. Or... Like my grand my my granddaughter when she was five wanted to play with her eleven year old brother, so she couldn't read the cards that we the game we were playing, but it wouldn't have made any difference with this one, and 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 we think we found a way to make braille dice that will hold up. Ooh! And so there we didn't we it wasn't advertised, but everyone's going to have a set of braille dice. Now NPR wants to talk to us about this. Nice. And the National Association of the Blind has um, re uh, expressed an interest. And so if either of those, you know, if the, if the National Association decides to endorse it, wow. What a, what a neat thing to have done. We have provided something for people that are sight impaired yeah. or illiterate. Doesn't matter either way. I've spent a lot of my time doing volunteer work as a tutor, I spent mm -hmm. 20 years with another organization here in Cincinnati. Um, so I'm real excited to get that out and show it to people and look how cool this is because I had a lot of fun reading the cards. Nice. And I know I, you know, I have a voice that I can manipulate and I'm aware of it. It's a gift. You know, I was born with it. And uh, to be able to use it in that regard was a ton of fun. Nice. So I'm, I can't wait until we get those damn games out of customs and uh, get telling because I think if we get an endorsement from the association, we'll probably be ordering a lot more games from China. Cool. So t King Eric, greatest of all, says, Tim, did you work on Boot Hill or Top Secret? Yes, <laughs> on both. I played wow. 
No, take, take, take that back. Not Boot Hill. No, I uh, picked that up after I had been up to my first uh, Gen Con. And because when I was in Carbon, my group in Carbondale didn't know it at the time, but they were play testers because Gary and I kept in touch and I'd try something new and he'd try something new and then, okay, how'd it work? You know, et cetera. <clears throat> so um, we uh, notoriously a couple of times took breaks and played Boot Hill for a weekend or something. Okay. Top secret. I was drummed into a test and managed to weasel out from then on. I it was not my cup. No, it was not my cup of tea. Running around is a spy, you know. I like to generate mood and atmosphere when I'm reading a description of a room you've just stumbled into. I don't need to remind you that the tension's high and you're sweating, you know. Because if a good spy movie's got a lot of tension. Yeah. Kind of wires your nerves a little, you know, wires your twist your wires up, you know, winds you up a little bit. Now, I'm not knocking the game. There are lots of people that enjoy it. It's well. Wonderful. It was not my cup of tea. And so I was only available on a volunteer basis to be a play tester then because I was pulled back. And I tried it once because they needed a warm body, and I begged off after that. Um, mm. Just not my thing. Obviously, um, there are people out there because Merle recently, you know, last year or so, year and a half ago put out a new uh, a new edition uh, and that was started the, the idea in this stuff was came out of the uh, drag uh, guy Gax magazine people um so uh it's just not my thing that's uh, the only the only uh i the only post-apocalyptic game i would play would be uh mutant crawl classics because it's simplicity and ease of its system yeah. um it's not a genre that I'm real familiar with, but shit, you don't have to be. Everything's a mutant. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the reason I would love that as a DM is that, oh, you think that's what it is? Oh, you think it has only that many hit points? Or only those powers? Yeah. If everything's mutated. Sky's the limit. Um, I like Dungeon Crawl Classic because um, the, the funnel game particularly is a good step back on the time machine into all right let's start you got a pile of first level or oh you got a pile of zero level player characters literally in front of you and they die off and mm -hmm. you go through and whoever lives becomes level one and now you can invent and start the game i yeah. love that aspect don't get so hung up on these guys dying a lot of people spend way too much of their emotions getting wrapped up in what's really doesn't exist beyond a piece of paper in their head and people get too involved and i've seen people sink into this in extremes that weren't good for them i've seen relationships destroyed i've seen like two engagements broken off because of something that happened in game, in game. Now, granted, I got a lot of years of, you know, so these weren't like right after one, right after another, but I've seen that twice. Hmm. Well, that's basically what led to what you were saying. You hated the three death saves in fifth edition. The, the, well, the we had a stable of characters. In Lake Geneva, everybody in the early game had a stable of characters. Because if you were playing in a campaign that had some geography to it, well, if that character's over here and you're playing over there, well, I guess it'll be Bruce this week. Or... Maybe you don't want to play a fighter again, and you'll take out your cleric. No. You know? Um, and so we never got that emotionally invested in any one player character. And so, yeah, it was it's a bitch. You're building this guy up to fifth, sixth level back in the old school. It's a bitch if he died. But I didn't go to a into a depression and need medication to come out of it. <laughs> King Eric, greatest of all, for a dollar ninety nine says thanks to Tim for making the greatest game ever. No, I was only, uh, unless you're talking about other games. No, I was only a part of it. I helped. That's all. Well, thanks I've ever for being part. How about that? I helped. I helped Gary shape it, and then I stayed back. <laughs> Logan, answer. Ask a question, sir. You've been quiet I for was, too long. I was good. I was good. Yes, I was. Thank you. Um, 
Tim, you have a great pra- passion for the game, clearly. And I, I have. Love games. I, I love I'm a games. Gamer. I've, I've been I'm gamer. I've been gamer since '83, and I've been running games so more than 35 years. I have a rule number one, and that's to have fun. Do you have anything like that going over the years? Oh, absolutely. Um, I get a lot of questions on my on my vlog or whatever they, my videos. I, how do I know if I'm a good DM? And my answer is always, did you guys have a few laughs? Did they come back next week? You're a good DM. Amen. But you got to have some laughs. Right. Now, yeah. I run a game that's completely ad lib, and we very often disrupt the whole room that we're in, bursting into laughter and in, a, in a, inopportune times. Because it's... The wheel of blame is not about me killing players. I learned that I could do that. I, I did it for years before my cancer diagnosis. I did it for years. I had an 83% kill rate, somebody told me, at total time. <laughs> right. And I, I said, well, damn, okay, you know. Only and, 83? Uh, Amateur. 83. <laughs> yeah. Come play in my game. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that. I want to see that so badly. You have no idea. How much well, the wheel of blame is. I'll explain it briefly because I run it online. Now I, the only people I've been doing it for lately are a bunch of guys in Okinawa and a couple ladies, and uh, we get together a couple, three, four times a year and we play. The wheel of blame is pre-gens. Pick the one you want. No magic users. Because with magic users restrictions on guessing what's going to happen, they'd be nothing but a meat sack in my game. My clerics are quite potent because I don't do clerical spells. They say prayers, and they have an ability within the ramifications of the 22211 of saying that many prayers of that potency. So they got them all at their fingertips. Now, everybody, I hand everybody... Uh, uh, an index card and on it they write me two things and I tell them nouns with as few adjectives and adverbs as possible because I still don't understand why the group that gave me a World War II flamethrower with a faulty ignition system got upset when it exploded as I told them later I probably wouldn't even have thought of making it blow up just you know whatever so for instance, bakery and cookie monsters. So do I get big gingerbread men that are, are, are belligerent or do I go Sesame Street? Well, you know, it, it, it just, it, all right. And the fun is at the end of the game, we go through the encounters one by one. Oh, yeah. Remember we did this? Remember we did that? Well, that's because I got this card that said this and that. And I, every now and again, I hear, oh, damn, I died on my own card. <laughs> and so this one was uh, a mouse and red bricks. And as I recall, I made a very militant uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, uh, an early, you know, Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse. And he uh, it was making slaves work, make red bricks. But, of course, they don't know that when they walk up. They go, oh, yeah, you see these guys with funny heads. And there's a big uh, building ahead of you and steam coming out of this, you know, and so we go in there. So for me, it keeps me sharp. For them, it keeps them laughing. You know, I go, oh, yeah, up in the distance. It's overrun by bugbears. And then you find out the bugbears are two feet tall because of the distance distortion and everything, because they are actually inside a wheel. So they can see two kilometers and it takes three to get there. So I get to I get to put them in any environment I want. Now, I'm not going to put them under the water without a cowrie shell to stick up their nose to let them breathe. You know, and I'm not going to float them in the air without some kind of flotation device, because what would be the fun of that? But underground, above ground, in the air, underwater, I, the wheel has everything available to it that I want to play with. And we have fun, and we mostly laugh, laugh, laugh. Now, I run this game for up to seven people online on my Zoom channel. I charge 90 bucks. Get seven people to divide that. That was at 1250 or something, you know, something ridiculous like that. So, you know, I'll, uh, I, I'm curmudgeon in the cellar 
<laughs> and my video, like it says there, a convention in the cellar, uh, contact me there. And if you want to run a game, well, once in my PayPal goes ding, then I send out the pre-gens and uh, the little rules thingy about what to look for. And like I said, these guys in Okinawa have already played, we played six times already. And I got another one coming up next month, I think. So, and they're great fun. It's not always the same, you know, same seven people, but there's always a couple, three from the last game. Nice. And they, I think they think that one day they're going to find out something I did before. But it isn't because I get seven different cards every time. Yeah. 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 You know, and the only rule in the game is if you think I'm on your card, be quiet. Don't meta game for the group. And if two guys put on fish, wow, all of a sudden two out of seven can't say a word. Oh, that's that's great fun for me. <laughs> they can do I'm stuff. Up. They just can't suggest your advice. I got a buddy in the chat who's asking, what did Gary think about the boule? He thought it was great. Because when he saw it ate hobbits and ponies, <laughs> it was exactly what we wanted it to be. And again, I stress, Gary never, ever reprimanded me on anything I published. He never, ever came in and said, publish this. It was my baby. <laughs> so, you know, that, that would have been so unlikely for him to, you know, hey, yeah. He th and actually, he thought it was pretty cool. You know, and the land shark, I, you know, well. And I went through how I heard the Saturday night, Candy Graham, Land Shark, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and so that was the name I needed besides Boule was the Land Shark, common name. And uh, he thought it was great, especially when he started cleaning out pony herds. Yeah, right. somebody asking about a pickle story? A pickle. Oh. <laughs> well, okay, this is one you have to put PG at least. Um, the very first time I ran the Wheel of Blame, was here at a con in Cincinnati. And I had an adult group that included one lady who I, I just knew which direction she was pushing. I'll explain in a minute. So they all gave me a card. And uh, one of them, the cards was Pickle and Red Dragon. So I decided to have a pickle about the size of the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile skewered on the top, the granite point of a very steep, slope, steep sloped mountain. And then from the distance, they saw what could, had to be a dragon. But then they closer and closer they got, they really wasn't very big and only had a four or five wings, you know, in foot's wings. <coughs> 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 Pollen season. Um, now, in every encounter, they have to find a talisman. It's a coin. has a picture of me on one side and on the back and says, it's not my fault. <laughs> and they don't find it. Well, yeah, see, in the Wheel of Blame, the only thing I will is my monster's two hit and my monster's reaction or, you know, initiative. If they get hit, they roll damage on themselves. If they do hit, they roll damage for the monster. I give them a lot of care lights and care serious as I just look at them as Red Bulls and super Red Bulls. And so they guzzle a Red Bull and they roll a one. Well, and don't be mad at me that it's only worth two, you know, D6 plus one. I didn't roll it. So it's never my fault. <laughs> never my fault. So they're hunting around, hunting around, hunting around for the to token. Back then, I believe I was actually using these little wooden keys I'd found in a craft shop, little ornate like Victorian keys. And so um, there, there's the pickle, and the dragon's been subdued, and they're running around trying to find the pickle. So the lady in the group, and I, I kind of expected this because I thought I'd already guessed what her card was going to be, goes up and says, I'm going to lick that pickle. I mean, there's no doubt of the innuendo here, right? And we're all adults just busted out laughing. Well, I was so, you know, dude, didn't see that one coming. So I rolled a 20-sider, and I got like a 17. So it cured all our hit points. <laughs> so, um, the next guy, next guy, you know, and um, he, he, I'm going to lick the pickle. Well, I rolled like a seven or something, so he got half his points. And the third guy runs up, and he's going to wreck the pickle. I rolled a two, and I told him he better come back in a couple hours because the pickle seemed to have lost its stamina. <laughs> and at that point, the table erupted. 
<laughs> just erupted. <laughs> and uh, they eventually found a thing. Well, then we got on to another one. The card I have was Undead Vixens and Portal to Another Dimension. So by this time, I figured it was probably her. Right, you know, because I didn't like the vixen class. Yeah, you know, we already had several nasty female things that didn't want to do good things with you. But anyway, uh, okay. So um, they, you know, I troped it real easy. Go through the wardrobe, at which point they were immediately attacked by 123 rabid, undead female foxes. <laughs> oh, the look she gave me! I should have been rabid after that. But she looked, and so I, uh huh, it was her card. Okay, that's what I try to do. I twist them around, and sometimes I do such a good job. They had no idea where it came from until I read the card. And they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh. And so that's why I do it. I have fun. Uh, the repeaters, they try to stump me. I have a list of things you can't bring, uh, you can't have on the card. No magic items. No player characters. No NPCs. No magic. Uh, no 10 foot poles, no nuclear <laughs> weapons. I had to, I had to put that one on recently. Um, somebody put on a card atomic bomb. Okay. I figured, okay, all right. I just put it in a huge iron box with a pat, you know, a giant lock on it. And figured, okay, it's out of the way. And we'll talk about it later after the game's over. Well, no, the guy playing the archer wanted to know how big is the keyhole? Did my arrow fit in there? Well, yeah, it would. After I told him the keyhole, you know. oh, my arrow would fit in there. I said, yeah, it would. Okay. Well, damn it, if the guy doesn't roll it like a 19 or a 20 and go in the keyhole. So I said, all right. And I rolled, and it was a really low number, which means uh oh, the timer just started ticking. So I said, well, you hear a tick, tick, tick coming out of there. Okay. Well, we're going to go around. I go, no, you're not. What do you mean? I said, the nuclear weapon just went off and you've all been vaporized along with a third of my wheel of blame. And that was only the second TPK I ever had. <laughs> and so I decided no more atomic bombs. Yeah. Sure. Brian, you got a question for the man? Brian, Me? So quiet. Yeah. Me? Yeah, well, quiet man. All right. Man. So, yeah, I do actually have a question. Does that beard oh. weigh down, down your chin and make it harder to talk? It, it does, yeah. <laughs> Like but it, 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 it also makes it easy to hide. So oh well, never <laughs> um, had one that long. Thank you. My hair no. used to be way, way, way long, but never mind. So outside of Dungeons and Dragons, I'm married. <laughs> what what was a what has been a game that has has really turned your eye, made you go whoa? This Are we talking cool. about board games? Uh, no, uh, role about playing RPGs? Game. Role, Yeah, role role playing games. Well, I just recently saw. A game by um, Jason Vay. Some of you may know him for Facebook. I know. Yeah. It's called The Wasted Lands. And I was, I'm really taken by the premise that sets the whole world up. I thought he did a really good, marvelous job of setting up a very in interesting premise into which we could step and play. Very, very interesting. Um, I, I I was very uh, taken. He, no, I'll be honest. He ran out and I was zipping by on my scooter. And he ran out and flagged me down. Here, I want to copy your game. Okay. So I decided to read it. And it's pretty damn good. Um, anybody with a, a smattering of uh, reading behind them should have no problem jumping into this world. Um, and that's something that a lot of other games don't. They make up a world or a setting that is too different when you could just, you know, use the basic standard settings and just take them off in your direction, make them exotic. Uh, uh, some people just make a jump that didn't work. And I don't think Jason did with this. I don't. Now I also saw an artist that came from New Zealand to the show. And uh, he could only bring one big crate. And he said he had trouble getting through customs when it had gnomes written on the outside. This guy you worked for Spielberg for 17 years as a designer. And oh my God, does he have a take on the gloaming? It's the deep, deep forest. 
Now he's going to put it out for 5e, but I'm telling you, anybody that gets a hold of a copy of this can easily convert them down to the, you know, whatever system they're playing. It would not be very difficult at all. And uh, I, I think it, it's going to make adventuring in the deep, deep forest really weird and really fun. That's what I just saw recently at Gary Con. Um, I play as many or more board games than I do RPGs. I basically only play RPGs when I'm at cons. Um, the the board the group the gamer group that I um, have here we play board games. What is uh, what is one of the better board games that you? Oh, recommend? Tom Wom's Feudality. Feudality. Xenoland put out a, a a thing of it, and I think. Um, Steve Jackson still has a light. No, Steve Jackson's got uh, awful green things. Feudality. It's wacky. It's weird. It's Tom Wom. Um, it's strategy. It's screwing the other players every chance you got. Uh, when you got a card that allows you to do it. Uh, in my group, that's A1. If you can screw the others. Now, if you want a fun one to play with um, people that aren't necessarily hard gamers, there's a game out called Scoville. It's about growing peppers mm -hmm. and crossing peppers to get other peppers, amassing enough peppers to cash them in to get rec chili recipes, which are worth points. It's about planting your peppers strategically so that the other people can't run in between your peppers and get the great one that you were planting. It's about blocking in the last guy so he can't move at all. It's got a wonderful screw your buddy get parts to it but it's also got a strategy with what colors you plant where and you have your own secret little lab where you can plant up to nine peppers during the course of the game and not let the other guys know that you're going after the recipe that's got the three ghost peppers in it because it's worth 27 victory points so it's got that type of planning of course not not every recipe comes up every game but there's always at least one that's worth a lot and it's hard to make. Um, I like that. Um, I love Gru, the barbarian card game. Goofy, silly, just fun. Um, I have almost all the uh, Ticket to Ride games and all the variants and all the little ones that were selected from reader submission or you know, player submissions. I, I like that game and game system. Um, 883 Viking. It's a wonderful game. It's the great army coming in and running all over, running amok all over England. And uh, Alex, uh, um, um, the Alfred the Great hiding out in the swamps and hoping the Vikings don't get him. Um, great game. I, I, it has a, a real nice touch of history to it. So I like games like that too. What's the highest level D and D character you ever kept alive? Twelve, I think. Any old school, which would be like a thirty-five nowadays. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Start at eight, you know. I mean, <laughs> no, you start at one, but you go to eight by by the third session. Yeah, I know. It's just yeah. it's crazy. But um, yeah, I had a, I had, I had two. I had a, um, I had a. Um, magic user and i also had a dwarf that went one level than the book said because something happened at gary con and he became a minor king and so i didn't play him anymore i just sent his troops whenever we were having a big battle and my dwarves would come up and this is this is before the hobbit movies and shit my dwarves <laughs> would come, yeah. well i had four units of dwarves from the old uh heritage models yeah. he had the first dwarves out and he was the first one to do ring mail by p poking a pin in mm -hmm. the green stuff, and it came out looking like ring mail. So, yeah, and actually I had uh, four units that had 32 figures each. Yes. Coco B would like to know, do you have any thoughts about the Buck Rogers in the 25th century game that TSR had put out? Um, I got a copy of it. I won it at a, at a um, festival carnival thing for St. Rudy's School of the Deaf. Um, it's okay. I mean, there, there's a lot, it depends. 
a game depends really on who's playing it and who's playing it with them. All right. Buck Rogers is great for probably nine to nine up if they have an interest in playing games. And, you know, if they've Buck Rogers is a hard sell if you've got a younger player who's not into rocket chips. Fair. They, um, there's, there's an old game called Serenissima. And it's all about uh, the trading empires of the Venetians and everything around the Med. And uh, the ad combat is very abstract, but it's a lot of fun. You don't need the history, but it has some history underpinning it. Um, that's another one I like a lot. And my probably my favorite board game is Fighting the Skies. Mm. My car. Yeah, I've been playing that yeah. since I was at TSR, and. Uh, the character that I lost that hurt the most in those campaigns was my Lieutenant Mouse Hockey. Um, and he went out on one of the abstract game. We would do abstract patrols and we had to all turn in our squadron orders. And then Mike would decide who saw when at one time. And then that's how we got the games that we'd play at his place. And Mouse Hockey went out and never came back and he had five kills. It's the only ace I ever had in that game. <laughs> Only oh, yes. <laughs> Have you ever played any uh, uh, superhero role playing games? No, no interest. Now, everybody's got a superpower. Well, that sounds like 5e. <laughs> I don't like skills and abilities. <laughs> I don't like that. I think that those things are built up during the course of play and becomes part of your character's backstory. You know, I, I don't like that. Um, Ask the questions to get the information. Don't roll the dice. You know, I do a perception check. No, no, you don't. <laughs> Tell me what you're doing. And I want to hear that you're examining each wall from top to bottom. And, and then, I don't want no damn dice roll. Tell yep. me what you're doing. Yep. Because especially in od and it was all about gathering information. If you don't ask me any questions, how are you gathering information? Don't roll an ability table and expect me to tell you something. No. Ask me the question, I'll tell you. Ask me to expand on it, and I will. <laughs> but don't roll a die. Oh, yeah, well, I have this uh, 87 um, skill in the woods. and it, oh, No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Now, the way we... All right, now, three, and three of the character classes came out of people from my group in Carbondale. But the way we had a thief, we had a guy that played a hobbit, and the first couple of times he tried, he opened rocks. So there's always a base chance. And so if he did it more often, I started giving him plus five, you know, plus 10, whatever. And he became the, the de facto thief because he had like a base 70% chance of opening. He didn't have to be a thief. He was just good at thieving. All right? And um, now, you know, you come in and it's like, here I, you are, a first level thief, and you got the perfect gloves, a complete set of burglar tools that cost you $30 on Zemu. And, uh, you know, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> Shit, my so, face hurts. We, 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 you know, guys became good at things because they succeeded at it frequently, and I gave them a better chance each time. Mm. And that's the way we had a guy who was in the group that was really good at doors, locks, you know, whatever. And uh, he became the party thief without having the capital T H I E F. You know, yeah. he was he started as a fighter. He was a hobbit fighter. He became the Hobbit thief, and he yeah. became quite good because he kept doing it. He made some, he made, he'd make some amazing die rolls, and he, you know, just week after week, he kept making the die rolls, and they became easier and easier. Now, I figure by old school standards, he was probably he probably had the thieving skills of eighth or ninth level. Sure. You know, and back then, boy, God, eight or nine level. We would retire characters between nine and twelve, yep. and play other ones. Yeah, because we had all the money amassed, so we built our keep, we hired our retainers, and we went and lived out 
somewhere in the boondocks. And once in a while, old players would get called up for some reason or other. Um, we had troops who we'd send when we were going to have a chain mail or a swords and spells battle. And we played other characters to try and get them to that position where they could then set themselves up for a life of ease and retirement, unless they didn't want to be easy and retired. So I have a question um, back in the old days of play. How how much? Yeah, I have no idea how that pangs every time somebody says in the old days of play. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, 50, okay, years, 50 so, years ago when I was yeah. just 25. Yeah. Well, allow me to rephrase. <laughs> no, no, that's quite all right. I, I just, that was a good, that was too good a shot to miss. Um, so when, when the game was being developed uh, and like the role play was still a fairly new thing there, like how, what depths did the players go into the role play? Uh, well, well were you guys clearly strategic or did you consider? I can, I can only, I can only say my group, which would have been in September of 74 when classes started back up. All right started with five guys that wanted to play the next week it was eight and pretty soon we're up to 13 and i'm running them all in one group because nobody knew what was going on so they were very easily explained to very wary i said are you sure you want to do that that would mean well, well, well let's rethink this you know um it was interesting some guys wanted to play with a voice well, not long at my table. <laughs> like I said, you know, a bunch of half-assed actors uh, that, that aren't even as good as what's on critical role. No, I didn't mean that shit. <laughs> now, I will admit one time I was DMing a game at GaryCon back before they were in the, uh, the Geneva Grand, like they are, or Grand Geneva that they are now. And something happened with it within what was going on that a very, very large snake, a constrictor of some sort was involved. And I don't run games as a rule unless I'm sort of half baked to begin with. Um, I, slipped in, I slipped in a parcel tongue and I don't know where it came from. I've not been able to do it before, but I had eight, nine guys at my table with their jaw open up. Because I slipped in to parcel tongue. I was spreading my tongue and slurring my S's. And I just fell into it for three or four minutes. And then, okay, it was counter over, et cetera, et cetera. So I wasn't even tempted to do it. I just did. And I guess if I was a wannabe actor, I might. But <laughs> it's, when I get somebody that kind of wants to sit down and, Crazy, sir. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Through the magic of magic, everybody is speaking in contemporary English. <laughs> and if you have to be from Brazil or Portugal, which I had PM players uh, this weekend, um, it's okay. We'll work through your accents. Don't worry about it. You know, but I, I don't get into that. That seems a little vainglorious to me. That's, you know, it is role playing, but it's not acting. It's role playing. You, you're supposed to sink yourself into this character's skin and just go about whatever's going on. You're not doing it on a stage for the Duke. <laughs> Again, Jason Harris's comment must be brought to the forefront. <laughs> if OSR was a dude, it would be you, Tim. It would be oh, you. <laughs> well, good. I'm, I'm kind of stuck there. Um, oh, it's fantastic. Listen, I, I, I'm... Well, it's where I like to play. And yeah, that's, what I no, that's what it's about. That's what yeah, it's about. Well, that's what, what I encourage on my convention in the cellar. I don't yeah. care what adventure you're, what edition. If you're having fun, you and your pe your people, your peeps are doing it right. Because yeah, the whole think. point of gaming is to kill some time that you're not slaving away at the factory. Yep. Or hoeing corn for your family. Yep. So yeah, whatever your plan, if you're yeah. doing it and having fun, fine. DCC, MCC, you know, fine. I was involved with both of those. When when Jim was writing it, was writing uh, DCC, or uh, working with DCC, I got to see it. And when we went to Mutant Crawl Classic, I got the first read on the manuscript. So, um, 
you know, I know I have a good understanding of what it is. And uh, if I wasn't playing swords and sorcery fantasy, I would be playing post-apocalyptic. Just because it's, uh, it's even wilder. Now, is it fair to say, if you're having fun, even if you're just being a bunch of half-assed actors thinking they're performing for the Duke, it's okay? <laughs> I don't care about what... The, yeah, but <laughs> I don't understand the people that want to watch it. <laughs> There's too much better shit on Netflix. Come on. Because <laughs> I have made the mistake of tapping in a couple, three times. And I'm just like, huh? I mean, they even sent me that big coffee table book a couple of years ago. I think it's still sitting over there behind me. Um, I don't care about those people. They were trying to make a cult of personality out of those people. I agree. And that was. There's some other, you know, it was part of what was going on in the West Coast, and some of the shit they tried didn't work. Um, you know, so the proliferation of character classes in, in fifth just runs 27 fingernails down a blackboard for me, for my sensibility. You don't need all those things. I, I there's no, I'd be dead before I'd let a dragonborn into my game. <laughs> it's just, all, all the, the the five the one thing that is really 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 bad about five e is everybody starts out buffed just yeah. by picking a character class they're min maxing at the onset mm -hmm. they're finding the guy that's got the best prevention yet no 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 go out and write your own backstory become the the famous picklock become the famous uh wall climber you know whatever well, I'll tell you, something I got into a lot of trouble for with the critters, as they're called, and like you said, you'll die before you let a dragon bane in the game. Well, I'll die on this hill happily. Critical Role's impact on the gaming community is minimal compared to, say, Stranger Things or Big Bang Theory, which oh, reached a far larger audience. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> now, I got nothing personally against any of the Critical Role people. I don't know that I've ever met any of them. But it just seemed to me that they were a bunch of wannabe actors um, trying out a gimmick to see if anybody pay money to watch them play. Turns out they did. American Dream. Yep. <laughs> Canadian one too. I'm not going to give them any of my money to watch them because I think they're a bunch of jackasses and jackanapes. But, you know, I don't need to have people declaiming. I think I'm going to go attack the dragon in a declamation. It sounds like it ought to be on a rostra somewhere. Oh, dear God. Any be... final questions, guys? We're getting down to the last few minutes here. Any final things we want to ask Tim before we let him go for the night? Oh, damn, you do have a long limit. <laughs> I, try to get I have no way. final questions, but I do want to say, Tim, it's always an honor to hear you talk. Always an honor to have you on. Just say it's talk. fun. I, I I, fun. It is fun, man. It is fun. It's really fun to you. You bring, look, look, you, you bring, you always bring a good time wherever you go. Yes. And I really yes. appreciate yes. that. But not only that, you do, you're, you're one of the last of the old guard. Right? Well, and I have, if I sat down and wrote it all out, I've got a hell of a CV. All the yeah. stuff mm. I've been involved yeah. in since 1974. So yeah. yes, I'm aware of that, but I keep yeah. telling people, damn, if I hadn't been fun, having fun doing it, I yeah. wouldn't have. No, exactly. So it's Absolutely. not like Gary changed my, chained my foot to the writing table and made me. No, I was having fun doing it. Yeah. And I, so, I still have fun doing it because that's what games are supposed to be. Fun. They're a diversion. Yeah. Agreed. Logan, Sean, Brian, any final questions? Oh, come on. Comments? You don't have one more gut punch for me? Come on. <laughs> no gut punch. It's just a fun one. What's your favorite race class combination from AD&D? Human. Pure strain. Nice. Me too. I, 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 if I were to start a new first edition character, it would probably be either a druid or a cleric. I've done all the fighters I wanted, and I've done a few magic <laughs> users. Um, I got a fan. I got a, like I said, I got a magic user up to twelfh level legitimately, and that's that's a back then that was a mighty accomplishment. Oh yeah. Okay. You know now you know three sessions and oh, I'm pushing twelve. What? <laughs> So, um, Logan, uh, Brian, anything before we wrap this all up? Just thank you, Tim. You, you're awesome. It's been great talking to you, listening to you. I love to talk. You might have guessed that by now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Brian? Yeah. So, all right. Modules or homebrew 
uh, campaign world? What's the preference? Um, in my my days nowadays, it's my home campaign, my own world. However, I believe in modules, if for no other reason, that new fledgling DMs should buy one and run it and get a handle for going home and creating something that you assume will be better. I think they're a marvelous teaching tool that we never had. Mm. We created them so we could score uh, uh, tournaments at conventions right. that made us shit tons of money. And that's why the G's, the G series was done for a t convention in Detroit that we took up, you know, a couple hundred of each of them and we'd put them on sale after the first one was over. We'd put a number one. We sold mm -hmm. out every one we took up there and wish we'd had, you know, 200 more of each one. Um, it was a new concept from us. Judges Guild have been doing marvelous stuff. Judges Guild, if you want to just find something to drop in and make your own, mm -hmm. the Invincible, uh, the city state of the Invincible Overlord has got not only the amazing city setting, but there's seven or eight other small side adventures right there for you. I mean, when it came out, um, we were using the um, something mines as a whole side adventure that was, was lasted a couple of you know a couple of sessions, and that was just a little extra thing tacked in on the side. Um, the sunstone mines. Yeah, I think yep. that was it. Yeah, the Sunstone Mines. Um, so there's nothing wrong with an adventure if it's well written. There's a lot of them out there that are crap. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you find one written by somebody that you, you know, look for a name you recognize. If you, Barring that, stick your hand out and go potluck. And if you like him, go look to see what else he might have done. Yeah. Yes, Cody. I just want to add one final thing before we close out. I'm going to give you, I, I want to shill for you a little bit, because if you like hearing Tim talk, make sure you go to his YouTube channel. Uh, he does. It's a weekly show, right, Tim? Yeah. Much yeah, unless I'm at a con. yeah. Right. Right. But it's I usually do, a weekly I do 49 show. or 50 a year. Yeah. Make, make sure to go up there and subscribe. He does that show. It's great. I watch it every week. Yeah, a lot of people watch it on Saturday morning. We're eating their yeah. breakfast cereal and Lewis Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> That's what they've told you. And I said, oh, man, if I can replace Mighty Mouse, on his own. There you go. You'll never replace Underdog. That's, the, that's just the truth. Oh, I wouldn't try to. No, there you go. Listen, Tim, I'm going to tell you I this right now. I did put him in an adventure once. Whoa. I'm sorry? A flying dog. Okay. Without the cave. <laughs> they kept kicking their ass. That was a few years ago. Tim, of all the guests we've had on here, I got to say, this is the one I can officially title was a hoot. Like, my <laughs> yeah. God, man. <laughs> my <laughs> God, man. I want, I'm want. i going to, I'm trying to get to Gary Con next year. I hope you're there because I just want to buy you a beer. Pretty soon. I, I think uh, as of next year, Gary Con will be the only one I'm going to. I made wow. a commitment to the family when Gary died that I would go to Gary Con as long as I'm physically capable. Nice. Uh, there's a, a new con in Battle Creek this year in July that my uh, off and on, you know, sort of partner is putting on called Wizard Tower Con, Wiz Tower, something in July in Battle Creek that I'm going, at least for his first one, and if it does well, he may do others. Yeah. But if it doesn't, I won't be going back. <laughs> Fair. Well, listen, if I make it to Gary Con next year and you're there, I owe I'll you be there. Be, unless you read I died the week before, I'll be there. Well, yeah, hopefully. And I don't mean that frivolously, because my great friend Jim, yeah. he called me on Friday night telling me there wouldn't be a pie because he was in the hospital after a heart attack. Mm -hmm. I told him, I can give a shit about the pie, get better. And I called back on Sunday and he was non responsive. Mm -hmm. And an hour and a half later, his wife came in and signed the papers and they turned off the machine. Mm -hmm. And then uh, his son uh, texted me like two minutes after they pulled the plug. Jesus. So. You know, and I'm, I haven't been that broke up about a friend dying. I don't know. I can't think of another one I got that's broke up. Even Doug uh, Ray down in Texas, who ran North Texas RPG Con, which is a good con. Um, he and I were diagnosed with cancer on the same week. And they opened me up, and I was two going into three, and they opened him up, and he was four. 
Okay. So he metastasized all over, and he still held on for five and a half years with stage wow. four colon cancer. And uh, yeah, we were we were close because we went through the chemo shit together, and you yeah. know, not the same place, just phone calls back and yeah, forth, yeah, yeah. pumping each other up. So that hit right. hard, but Jim was worse. I think we can honestly all agree that one of the things this hobby has given us is some lifelong friends and people that we oh, know. without a doubt. That's why half the fun of going to Gary Con is seeing people you only see at Gary Con once a year. <laughs> now, yeah. some of them you might call during the year or whatever. Jim and I were much more frequent than that. One of us called the other. And um, I've told the story before. And when, whenever he'd call, he'd ask, first thing I'd ask him is, have you lost any more bits yet? Because he was having a series of amputations with his diabetes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure it was the diabetes that stressed the heart. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, and he laughed. He, nope, nope. I'm holding firm, holding firm. You know, that, that was just kind of the level of our friendship that I could say something as heinous as that and he'd laugh. And that's the only reason I did it because I knew he'd laugh. Yeah. Well, that seems to be your thing is making people laugh in my I hope You certainly well, did that for us tonight. You so. should have heard me in the 70s when George Carlin had all his albums out. I, I have his, I can do his voice <laughs> then on. And I had a couple of his bits memorized. And I still will step into a, without thinking about it, his cadence. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, I, I'll leave this with a quote from George. Please. Look at your average person, average intelligence, whatever. Half the world is dumber than he is. Guys, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, this More was than a pleasure. My pleasure. I had a good time. I'm glad you did. Everybody in the chat, thank you for joining us tonight on all the channels that are simulcasting this. It was a great time. And Tim, we will definitely try and have you back on at some point in the future if we can, because my God, man. Yeah, we haven't laughed this hard in a while. Let me know. I haven't laughed this hard since COVID, baby. So thank you <laughs> well, for that. Good. During COVID, I read children's stories and fairy tales because several of my friends had little kids that were going mm -hmm. up the walls. So I, I, oh, go on my YouTube channel. You'll find them. I wrote, I read a bunch of, I read some, wrote, some, read some Finnish and Irish. You know, I was looking for oddball stuff that was of a right length to read for small children. I had sure. a great time doing that. Now so there, I got a little critical roly because oh, wow. you read your story to a kid. Well, you man. know, voices. We'll forgive you this once. We'll yeah. forgive you. <laughs> From the well, half-assed actor side range, of the conversation. But no, I use a different I use, I use a different <laughs> range and timber in my voice when I'm reading the kids. So the channel is Curmudgeon in the Cellar? Yep, Curmudgeon in the Cellar on YouTube. If, right. you know, if you can't spell Curmudgeon, spell Cascoid, K-A-S-K-O-I-D. Or my last name, any one of those three will get you to it. There you Just go. make sure you, you get on to the newest ones because depending upon what's been watched, I'll go up there and there's number three eight three oh eight next to one forty six because <laughs> somebody was watching one forty six. Nice. And uh so uh just yeah, you can go back to the beginning and just jump in where I'm at now. If all you right, like guys, go back to the beginning. Head over, subscribe to that, and please subscribe to all of these fine gentlemen who have joined me on the panel tonight. GM Cody, Game Masters. Merlingster Gurbindinger. I can't he just musings, everybody just musings. Yeah, I know gamer. And Logan from the Hilt, go check that as well. And if you like, I, what you here at I Zan just Kong, noticed that. Go ahead. As yeah. soon as you stop the show, I'm going to talk about. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop the show right now. So thank you, everybody, that was here tonight. Night, Peace, love, geek, and we'll see you next week for another one of these. With the, oh yeah, Mr. Larry Elmore is going to be here next oh, week. You might want to check that fun. out. Oh. That'll be fun. The country gentleman. <laughs>